Would you say farm birds? That was a novel, wasn't it, or a show? The farm birds? TV series, yeah. <coughs> farm, is it birds or birds? Birds. Okay. Okay, today is November the 21st, 2019, and we will prepare ourselves in our usual fashion by having a few moments of silent prayer, the option of rebound if necessary. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. None of us should take even one day for granted. It is a gracious gift on your part. And you provide everything that we need for this day. We need 
Bible doctrine and you provide that. We need the filling of the Holy Spirit and you provide that. You provide your phenomenal word. Everything that we need. And yet we are prone to wonder. We're prone to be distracted. We're prone to get angry. Get into self-pity, the whole host of mental attitude sins. And you are ever there ready to forgive us. All we need is the humility. And now we have assembled ourselves here to study your word. We're finding out more about how believers in the Old Testament were saved. It's another piece of the puzzle that we see in order to recognize your plan, your grace, your mighty salvation. And we need that. We need it to put in our arsenal for when we talk to other people that we can tell them boldly and dogmatically that you offer grace and always have and always will. And that is our contact point with you. That is how we connect with you. And any time that arrogance imposes its face into our lives, then we suffer. We suffer because we can't have that close, intimate relationship that you desire to have with us. So we pray that you will help us this evening to focus, have an open mind, concentrate, so that we can put into long-term memory the things that we learn and give you all the praise and adoration. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> the first thing I want to do is bring something to your Notice, you may have already heard about this. It's not world-shaking, but it is a, a sign of what happens over a period of time when someone starts to get sloppy, starts to let their guard down. I'm talking about uh, what's ha happened recently with Chick-fil-A. Have you all heard about that? Uh, Chick-fil-A, the headline here says, Stunning Change at Chick-fil-A. Uh, it says they won't donate to Christian groups vilified by the LGBT movement. So they were going to, it says in a shocking turn of events, Chick-fil-A will no longer donate to a number of Christian groups vilified as anti-LGBT groups, including the Salvation Army and the Fellowship of Christian Athletes, according to Business Now. And so because... Chick-fil-A started donating to these charities. The LBGT started picketing and raising all kind of hell about it. And the CEO caved in and said, we won't, <clears throat> we won't do donate to them anymore. I think, was it Dan Cathy? Was that the, the original owner? Was that his name, Dan Cathy, I believe? He would not bow to anyone when he knew that he was right and the Lord was behind him. And they went... They, they won more than one, I think many, lawsuits for people who would come against them, and they would not budge. And he understood you don't, in, in any way, negotiate doctrine away, truth away. And so that is sad to see that that once great company now has gone the route of so many just to do the expedient thing rather than the right thing. And that's a message to us. We are... Uh, prone to do the same thing on any day sometimes in several times in one day we have to make choices whether we're going to do the easy thing the expedient thing or are we just going to do what is right and say what is right do what is right and let the chips fall where they will that's not arrogance that is being a good and faithful servant how else are people going to know what truth is if they don't see it through us. One other little tidbit here. It says trending. I'm not sure what trending is. Matthew could probably tell us. Uh, is that when something is popular and it's being discussed or something? It's, it has to do with the internet, doesn't it? Okay. Yeah. It's, it, we, we might say it's in the news now. Okay. It says Facebook removes Angel Mom's post on illegals permanently bans donations to Angel Families Group. I'm sure this was, well, it says it's Facebook. And Facebook, they say, 
is more powerful than a lot of countries and are do nothing, lackadaisical, don't know what they're doing, Congress allows this type of thing to happen. These big conglomerates like this need to be reined in when they start pulling a trick like this. Angel moms are moms who have had one of their family members uh, killed in, in action in the, in the military. And so this angel mom made a comment on, I, I, I don't know what it is, oh yeah, Facebook, uh, about illegals, illegals coming in across this border. Well, the, the nut jobs that are in charge of these big conglomerates like Facebook, I don't, I don't know what conglomerate, that, that probably would be several companies. This is just one company that is super powerful. Ban donations to these women or, or these families who had lost a loved one in the military service. Can you imagine doing that? Because you, they don't agree with what she said about illegals, that they're banning donations to these families. I don't know about you, but that, that gets my blood up when I see these. And, and these type of things go on all the time. And they are going, they're happening more and more often. And you keep thinking, when is somebody going to do something about this? And I have good news for you. There is someone that's going to do something about this. And he's not going to negotiate. He's going to set it all straight. And I can't wait for him to return. Because when he does, you're going to notice the change big time. Yes, sir, Mr. Garth. I'm sure most of you hear it. Oh, I don't mean that. Yes, you do. You, they can't hear you on the. They can't hear you on the thing. And when when some people say something, and, and I don't have a uh, mic, I'm the one that catches the heat. Uh, I'm I'm sure most of you here have heard of Quan L X. <laughs> yeah. Have you seen him lately? No. On television. You know, he has somebody he argues with about different things, uh -huh. you know, one-on-one. -on -one. And they was talking about, I didn't hear the first part about the LGBT thing. Uh -huh. But anyway, the guy that he was arguing with, uh, they was talking about what the Bible says. He said, well, I, I go by what the Bible says, what God's Word says. And this guy says, well, you know, some of that has changed. And he said, no. He said, it hasn't changed. He said, and the God I worship never changes. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I don't know too many things I would agree with him on, but yeah. I mean, he stood up there. And I'm wondering if his program is going to get... Well, if he does that on... Twitter or Facebook, I doubt that he's on now, this Twitter. This is on Facebook. channel 13 or 26, <laughs> yeah. one of those. Well, uh, Quanel X. And I wouldn't agree with any, hardly anything that he would say, but I do agree with that. You have to recognize when someone has the courage of their conviction. I've heard him many times, but he knows the Bible. Yeah. Of course, he does things and says things that are... <laughs> yes. Yes. That's news, isn't it? Quanell X. He is a. Uh, do, do you know what's what's that guy that one of his cohorts that uh, uh, Obama took a picture with? What was that guy's name? Farrakhan. He is uh, akin to. Louis Farrakhan. You know who that is? Louis Farrakhan? He's a head of what? Yeah, he's a, a, a they're agitators. Uh, they, they're just not the type of people that you would want to associate with. Okay, now let's, uh, let's get on to uh, where we are tonight. And I'm just going to put on the board where I want to start. This I'm going to cover some of what we did last night because we need to review. It's my fault that we don't review enough. And so I'm going to make an, in, I'm going to endeavor to review more because reviewing is the mother of learning. So what I'm putting, you see right at the top paragraph there, this is where we have come to. 
because we have already looked at Genesis 3.15, you all knew that verse before, I would imagine, because that's the first sign, the first mention of a Redeemer, of the Messiah, the seed of the woman, that would set things straight. So, I might read this twice so that we really get it rooted in our soul. So the people of the Old Testament had the gospel message passed down by word of mouth concerning the promises of the seed of the woman. And also the gospel message in the stars, which also was passed down by word of mouth. Those two things are huge because some people think, well, they didn't have anything. No, they had something. There's no way that Adam would not pass along the promise of the seed of the woman, and there's no way that he would not also pass along God's message in the stars. I can visualize that before Adam fell, that the Lord would come in the cool of the evening, in the evening, evening time, when the stars came out, and the Lord would say, okay, this is scene one. And that maybe Virgo was up there, and he would explain to him what that message was all about, and even the star names. And Adam was no dummy because God trusted him to name the animals. And so surely he could remember some star names as well. So this is my point. They had this, both of these things going for them. Now was it perfect? Did did the did Every single father teach his children about the seed of the woman and the message in the stars? Well, probably not. But it was enough for, for, as, for us to see as things unfold. You see up here, Noah is coming up next. Noah knew about this. And I'll just press on from here because there is a link that I made. And I didn't see this until I was studying just the other day. And it came to me. And it makes sense, and I think it is not only plausible, I think it's probable that this link that I made, this, this connection, is valid. So we, we see in Genesis chapter 8.20, uh, after the flood, Noah came out and immediately following, he came out of the ark with the animals, built an altar, and sacrificed them. Now, I had a conversation with someone the other day, and I said, that's a big deal that he came out and God did not command him to do it. It appears from reading the text that he did it on his own initiative. Now, I don't guess we can say unequivocally that we know for certain that God did not command him to do it, but I would think that if he had that would have been part of the text. It would be a, a, an important ingredient in this that would be left out. Whether, he, whether God commanded him to do it or not, the point is it wasn't something that was strange to him. He knew how to do it. He, he understood the importance of substitutionary sacrifice. He had to know that even when they got on the ark because they had enough animals that were considered clean animals, the kind that you would sacrifice. All the others, they had a pair, but these, they had more. And so at the purpose, the reason they had more was so that when he got off the ark that he could make these sacrifices. Boy, how hard would it would be if there was only two and he sacrificed them. <laughs> so we, there's a connection there. So I'm just going to drop down to where I make the connection here. This in italics all is quoted from the book. Now these are some points that I made. The promise of the seed of the woman guaranteed the defeat of Satan. That's part of the promise. And his wounding. Remember that he was going to be bruised on the hill? And this is referring to his sacrificial death on the cross. We see this in Genesis 3.15. Now see, we can read that into Genesis 3.15. The people back then didn't know this last part about, oh, that would be a sacrificial death of Jesus Christ on the cross. They didn't know that. 
but they knew that there was going to be some kind of sacrificial uh, sacrifice. Obviously, it would be the seed of the woman that would do that. So, I'll start from the beginning again. The promise of the seed of the woman guaranteed the defeat of Satan and his wounding, being bruised on the hill, his sacrificial death on the cross, Genesis 3.15, was made before the Lord sacrificed the two innocent animals in Genesis chapter 3, verse 21. Why is that significant? In order to... The, this, the sacrifice of these innocent animals was to cover the physical and spiritual nakedness of Adam and Eve. Now, we know that they were physically naked. They had always been physically naked. They didn't even know what clothes were until they ate of the fruit. And then their eyes were open to things. They could know that they, got, they had the ability to not only know good, but they knew evil as well. And one of the first things that they found out, or part of this evil thing, was, oh, this beautiful body that God had created, and perfect bodies were nasty. There was something bad about them. And so even to the extent to where they had to cover it. Why could they know that? Because evil now was lurking about. And the, the, the understanding that there was evil, and it panned out immediately, they had to cover themselves. So that is the spiritual nakedness of Adam, Adam and Eve. So it would appear Adam recognized the, that the substitutionary sacrifice of the innocent animals that occurred right after this Genesis 3.15 promise represented the substitutionary sacrifice that the seed of the woman, Jesus Christ, would make in order to satisfy the justice and righteousness of God. Adam was no dummy. He could, he could put two and two together. And so he made that connection. Because here God sacrificed these innocent animals in order to cover his sin. And here the, he, he just promised that the seed of the woman would be bruised. What does it mean bruised? He would be wounded. Isn't that what happens to innocent animals? who are sacrificed, they're bruised, they're wounded, and we know that this bruising was unto physical death, that he would die. That would mean he was a substitutionary sacrifice that had to be made for man to be right with God again. And God took the initiative to, to kill these two innocent animals and present these skins to them in order to cover themselves and that's what he does with God, with Jesus Christ too. He take, he took the initiative in eternity past and decided this is what would have to be done in order for him to keep his absolutely perfect, stainless, pure justice and righteousness. And so this came together. And how much do you see about these sacrifices in the Old Testament? It's everywhere. Very important because it was the singular thing that even Adam connect could connect and say, now these things are going to continue to happen. And it was pointing to the sacrifice of the true Lamb of God that was absolutely perfect. See, you understand why the, the, the animals had to be perfect because they rep represented Jesus Christ. So when they had a lamb back there, they would save it for 10 days and they would watch it. If there was any kind of blemish, any kind of the least bit of something that would make that not the perfect, the best specimen they had, they had to discount it. It was not qualified to go. So it would appear Adam recognized that the substitutionary sacrifice of innocent animals represented the sacrifice, substitutionary sacrifice that, of the seed of the woman, Jesus Christ, would make in order to satisfy the justice and righteousness of God. When Old Testament believers sacrificed innocent animals, it was a public demonstration that they believed that the seed of the woman would someday make things right between them 
and God. Now, was that perverted? Oh, yes, it was perverted. Uh, they started making the ritual that if you didn't do that, then you were essentially a heretic. Now, God commanded them to do it, but they thought the very practice of taking these inner animals and sacrificing them is what made them right with God. But if they were doing that, and in their mind, they were not connecting those innocent animals with what the seed of the woman was going to do to take away their sins, then it was ritual without reality. It meant nothing. So there's still a connection that has to go on. It's just like when we have communion. We have a special time where we just, we, we just sit and we're concentrating, we're meditating on Jesus Christ and all the thing, great things that he's done for us and God's plan. All of this is a special time. But if you're sitting there and you're thinking about, I wonder, did I turn the oven off? Is my roast going to burn? Or how am I going to pay the bills this month? And this, this type of thing, then it means nothing. It's ritual without reality. And they did it publicly, by the way. Jesus Christ was sacrificed publicly as a witness to this. Now Noah didn't know that Jesus would be, uh, didn't know that Jesus Christ would voluntarily be sacrificed on the cross. He didn't know anything about a cross. It didn't come into play until about 519 B.C. So he didn't know anything about the cross. He certainly didn't know that this seed of the woman would someday be named by God Jesus. We'll get to the, more about that in a little bit. And that someday the seed of the woman would remove the sin barrier between man and God. So he felt comfortable in approaching God through the sacrificial death of animals which portrayed the future sacrificial death of the seed of the woman. They knew this. And sometimes God would chastise them because they would get sloppy. And it was an agricultural society. They, and they had herds and they had uh, agricultural products. They had wheat and so forth. And they were supposed to give the best, the best they had, and they would sacrifice it, the animals, or they would take the wheat and they would burn it or whatever they're going to do. And they started saying, well, this, this would be a good time for me to get rid of the coals. And they get some old crippled lamb or whatever, or just so they would, because they could get more money for the best one. And they were going on with that and, and thought they could fool God. Of course, they had to pay for that. Okay, that's why I want to make those connections to reaffirm those. And now we'll go down to where we're going to start tonight. We covered a lot, didn't we? Oh, this was the last thing. This was the last thing we covered Tuesday night. I want to go over that one more time again to solidify again in our in our minds. Salvation is always by faith, based on the work of Christ on the cross. Period. There's no other way. We call it faith alone and Christ alone. It's always been based on that, even though we see it in these terms, and we can articulate it this way, they would articulate it another way, but the basic, the basic idea is God is going to provide a way through the seed of the woman in order to make things right between us and him. Since Revelation is progressive, we know a lot more details now. Still, it's essentially the same thing. God withheld judgment of pre-cross sins until Jesus became our substitute on the cross. And we looked at that the other day. Uh, here it is right here. Remember we went through uh, Romans 3, 25 through 26. He just put a lid on sin. But what was the penalty if they did not make those sacrifices? If they just said, no, I'm not going to do it. Well, by the time the Mosaic law got there, then they could be executed for it. But this is, we're talking about here, I'm kind of talking about even before Moses came along and the law. 
So before there was Moses and the law, still this, this substitutionary link of what was God was going to provide in the future was what they would concentrate on or what they would rely on. However, Old Testament people could be saved by believing what God had promised, that there would be a Redeemer, a Savior, an intercessor, a sinless substitute. I don't care what name you want to put it, or you could put in there the seed of the woman, whatever it is, they understood God would, did not leave them in the lurch. He would provide a way of escape. They had, we, we can't do anything our own. God had provided, and he revealed it to them, as I have been describing. So whether it was an intercessor, a sinless substitute, who would bear the sins of the world, pay the penalty for man's sins, and satisfy the demands, demands of infinite justice. Those who would believe in God for this deliverer were justified or declared righteous before God. For he imputes his righteousness to all who put their faith, and I should put faith alone, in him, Christ alone, for salvation. It's always been that way. It always will be that way. And then we went into Romans 3, 23. We went, okay, here's where we're starting another area now. We're getting very close to the end. We might end tonight. I'm not sure. <clears throat> it's called, can we find Jesus in the Old Testament? What do you think? <laughs> A very positive yes on that. Throughout the Old Testament, more and more information is given about a deliverer, a savior, a substitutionary sacrifice who would die for the sins of the world. And this one is des designated as Messiah or Yeshua, which is the Hebrew equivalent to Jesus. Jesus' name in the Hebrew is Yeshua. And I pointed out before, there was another one that we studied whose also name was Yeshua, and that was Joshua, or you might say, Yeshua. When the word salvation in the Old Testament occurs along with the prefix meaning my, yours, or his, it is the same word, Yeshua, Jesus, used in Matthew 1.21, that sounded like Jesus used, it was an angel, if, if you can't see this and you're just hearing it, let me put it this way. The Hebrew prefix meaning my, your, or his, it is the same word, Yeshua, and then in parentheses, so you know what that word is, is Yeshua. So that word was used, or that, it was used in Matthew 121 when the angel spoke to Joseph Husband of Mary, he said, she will bear a son and you shall call his name Yeshua, meaning salvation. That was the first time that this one that would come, the seed of the woman, actually was named. Right there. Bear a son and you shall call his name Yeshua, salvation, for he will save his people from their sins. And that's Matthew 1.21. The name of Jesus occurs in the Old Testament in Hebrew form, Yeshua. When Jacob was about to die as his blessing and, and as he was blessing his sons and prophetically foretelling their future experiences and those blessings, he said, quote, I wait for your salvation, O Lord. That is Genesis 49, 18. And then, Jim Myers, friend of mine, phenomenal guy. Or it could be translated in Yeshua, meaning Jesus, I am hoping or trusting, O Lord. Jacob was trusting in Yeshua, Jesus, for salvation. Jacob was already saved, a saved man and had not, has not waited until his dying moments to start trusting in the Lord. He just reminded God that he was trusting in Yeshua for salvation and at the same time he was comforting his own soul. I can imagine myself, you can probably imagine yourself if you were 
uh, injured horribly in some way, and you knew you only had minutes to live, I can see myself saying, if someone was around, telling them, I put my total faith in Yeshua, in Jesus. I am waiting for him. He is my salvation. It's not that I would just be uh, saying that to be saved at that point. That happened a long time ago. But when it comes down and you're going to die at any time, I can understand the thought, I'm going to make sure that God knows, <laughs> even though he knows everything, I'm putting my whole trust in Yeshua, in Jesus Christ. And he was telling his sons that as he was blessing them so they would understand that as well. And I think most people, I think probably everybody in this room, maybe everybody that's uh, hearing this, would probably be prone to do the same thing. Lord, just remember, you know, I'm, I'm trusting. My faith is in Jesus Christ alone and nothing else. Just thought I'd make a memo right before I checked out about that. That's what that is about. It, comfort, it would comfort his own soul. It would comfort ours as well. In Isaiah chapter 12, verse 2 through 3, salvation is mentioned three times with Jesus as the personification of the word salvation. The first one is, Behold, God is my salvation. And then in brackets, Yeshua. The word salvation there is Yeshua. Jesus, in his pre-incarnation and internal ex existence, is Yeshua, or was Yeshua in, in his pre-incarnate. I will trust and will not be afraid, for the Lord God is my strength and my song, and he has become my Jesus, my salvation. With joy you draw water from the wells of salvation, which is actually the wells of Jesus. It could be understood that because Jesus' name is salvation. Isaiah makes this more explicit in Isaiah 62.11. Behold, the Lord has proclaimed to the end of the earth, say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your salvation comes. Now, this is very interesting. Look and listen very closely here. This is in Isaiah 62, verse 11. Behold, the Lord has proclaimed to the end of the earth, say to the daughters of Zion, Behold, your salvation, we have in there Yeshua comes. Then it says, Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. These are pronouns. So the word Yeshua has to be a person. You see? It's not just an ethereal thing of salvation. It's actually saying, the, say to the daughters of Zion, behold, your salvation, behold, Jesus is coming. Your salvation comes. Jesus comes. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. You get it? That's not a thing. It's not an ethereal thing. It is a person. And the word there is saying Jesus' name in the Hebrew. I think it's just phenomenal that all, you go through all these times in the, in the Old Testament and you see the name, uh, so, I mean, many times it says salvation, and what is it saying? It's saying Yeshua. It's saying Jesus. Every time it says salvation, it was saying Jesus. But they couldn't connect that word with Jesus because he hasn't been named yet. But we can look back on it now and say, wow, Jesus is all over the place. Every, in, in the original language, everywhere you look, every time it's salvation, there's Jesus, Yeshua. So here salvation is a person and not a thing or an event. He comes, his reward is with him, and his work is before him. This salvation is Jesus himself. You got that? Salvation is in him. If he doesn't come, if he wasn't everything that he claimed to be, then we have no salvation. For he is salvation. The last two sentences, I threw in there. I wasn't reading it from the book, by the way. <clears throat> so this salvation is Jesus himself. When Simon came to the temple and took the baby Jesus in his arms, he said, Lord, 
Now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation. And he was holding the salvation, Yeshua. You see, you just don't, when you speed reading to be able to say that you read the whole Bible, you miss things like this. Well, even if you don't have someone that can put these terms together, isn't that just so powerful? He was holding his salvation, he says. And look, he says, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace. He wanted, he knew the salvation. He knew the, the seed of the woman was coming. He believed that it was going to happen. And then he, he says, according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation. I thought he was holding, but it says that he, he has seen your salvation, which was Jesus. Well, I see where I have, up in the right at the top of this. The context is the salvation is Jesus himself. When Simon came to the temple and took the baby in his arms, that's where I got it. That's the context. That's Luke chapter 2, verse 29 and 30. The hope of Israel is the Lord Jesus Christ. And in him, steadfast love and plentiful redemption. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. I wait on the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than a watchman for the morning, more than watchman for the morning. Can you imagine walking on the ramparts? It's cold. You have some meager clothing to try to keep you warm. And the long night drags on. And you're waiting to see that color start to change, a little brightness on the horizon. You just can't wait. As soon as that sun rises, your watch is over. You can go and get comfortable and get, get warmth and everything. That's how we should be looking for the return of our Lord. We just can't wait for it. O oh, Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is steadfast love. With him is plentiful redemption. And then we have Psalm 130, verse 3 through 8. And I want you to turn in your Bibles. This is a sharp psalm. It starts at verse 3 because the, the top part is just setting up the psalm. When you read the Quran, they say that there's no love in it, there's no forgiveness. It's just dominant domination and fear look at look at that compared to psalm 130 verse 3 through 8 and there are multitudes of verses like these but this is too good not to read i want you to read it from your own bible because you might want to mark it somehow psalm chapter 130 verse 3 if you lord should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. I wait for the, for the Lord. My soul does wait. And in his word I do hope. I'm going to stop there for just a moment. That just described the Christian way of life for all of us. That is what we should be doing in that one verse. I wait for the Lord. My soul does wait, and in his word I do hope. Anytime you get away from that, you are in troubled waters. Verse 6. He says it again. <clears throat> My soul does wait. Excuse me. My soul waits for the Lord more than the watchman for the morning. Indeed, more than the watchman for the morning. O Israel, Hope is in the Lord. Nothing else. Hope is in the Lord. For with the Lord there is loving kindness. 
And with him is abundant redemption. And he will redeem, redeem Israel from all his iniquities. That's a beautiful psalm right there. It gives comfort if you believe it. So many people have a misguided idea that Christian, Christians serve a God that just wants to keep you from having fun. He tells you it's all about you, what you can't do and what you can do. It's about the do's and don'ts. They have no concept. They can't appreciate a psalm like this because it's not about do's and don'ts. It's about love. It's about mercy. But love above all other things. When we, we can't even imagine what it took for Christ to live, glo leave glory and go to the cross, the horrible thing that was. But also, how hard was it for God the Father to take his son and have him go through it? And why, why, did, why did he do that? It was for love for us. But both behind that is how important it is to God that people recognize his righteousness and his justice is as infinite as his being. And anybody that would besmirch that doesn't have a clue about God or love. We're at the conclusion now here. Are y'all ready? People before the time of Christ did not have a full picture of the Savior and the cross. However, they did have an adequate picture that was sufficient for salvation. Now let that sink in. I'm going to read it again. People before the time of Christ did not have a full picture of the Savior and the cross. However, they did have an adequate picture that was sufficient for salvation, and that's what I've been talking about all tonight and the time before, in fact, during this whole thing. God has always revealed his plan of salvation, and that revelation has always been sufficient to bring man to salvation. God is not lax. He is not handcuffed to where he can't present his salvation to people so where they can understand it. I think about in the church age that people get common grace. Unbelievers can't understand spiritual things. It's nonsense to them. But when you present an accurate gospel to them, the Holy Spirit can enter into their soul and make it understandable to them. That's why you don't want to debate Jehovah Witnesses or anything else about anything. Well, that's, they don't, it doesn't matter. You get on the gospel and the Holy Spirit is going to make that clear and lucid and perspicuous to these people so that they can make a decision and they will be held accountable to that decision because they can understand it because of God's grace. God has always revealed his plan of salvation and that revelation has always been sufficient to bring man to salvation. In John chapter 5 verse 24, I believe this is the last verse that is quoted. As it says in John 5, 24, truly, truly, which means, now hear this, get, I'm trying to get your attention, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes in him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Is that complicated? I believe a six-year-old or maybe even younger can understand that. Now this last, I've got two paragraphs left here in this book. And I got it in yellow because I, th I, I think it's worth highlighting. So salvation in the Old Testament was not by some generic faith in God, but by faith in a God who would send the Savior. Faith in a God who is not sending the Savior does not save. 
And you notice that's a little g there. It's not a typo. That's referring to a God who does not save. How are people in the Old Testament saved? By faith in the salvation promised by God. This salvation is a person. The promised seed of the woman. The promised seed of Abraham. The promised seed of David. The promised deliverer, Yeshua. By means of faith in Messiah, as he was revealed at any point in history, man is saved from his sins. Romans 4, verse 16. I was wrong. This is the last, this is the last uh, scripture in the book. Romans 4, 16 says, That is why it depends on faith in order that the pr promise may rest on grace. What promise is he talking about? What he just mentioned here, going all the way back to Adam in Genesis 3.15. The seed of the woman. Backed up by the God's message in the stars. And the creation itself. No one has an excuse for saying, I just didn't have enough information. Especially the Jews. Now this concludes the article 21 Tough Questions About Grace and this, this is what that subtitle here How Were People Saved in the Old Testament by Jim Myers. The following are a few quotes from other authors on this same subject matter. Now I have about 10 minutes so I might have to go a bit fast through this but I want to get this done because Tuesday we're going to start another question. I already have it ready. But I don't want to have a little, a little piece of this left, so we're going to get it tonight. Are y'all ready? Are you, you have your, 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 um, loins girded? Yeah. Yeah, I want to run it. Okay. So the following are a few quotes from uh, authors, uh, other authors of the same subject matter. This is from, uh, I think it's Renee Lopez. Yes. Old Testament salvation from what is where this came from. Eternal redemption is obtained solely through God's grace. That is the unique element of Hebrew scriptures and the sine qua non, meaning something absolutely indispensable or essential of the Christian faith. So what we're talking about is something, not a side issue, but absolutely essential to the Christian faith. And that is that redemption is obtained solely through God's grace. Even if the term save and salvation carry a sense of eternal salvation, in some Old Testament passages, there is no explicit instance where the term appears solely with a spiritual nuance. That's, that's bold. He's saying you can't go to one place in the Scripture, Old Testament, where it is only about eternal salvation. Well, he says that, no explicit where the term solely and spiritual nuance to it. While salvation may come with a spiritual nuance in the Old Testament, he's saying that it doesn't come with it, but it never comes alone. It always has a broader meaning attached to it. Salvation, <clears throat> let's see, where am I? Yeah. Salvation here comes by physically restoring the nation Israel to the land of promise placing them in a position of blessing. So, so many times when it's talking about that the Lord is going to save Israel. Well, it means to deliver Israel. and doesn't mean that they're all going to be eternally saved. It means they're going to be delivered from some kind of physical harm. Many times it's talking about death or being defeated or whatever it may be. A survey of the literature addressing this subject reveals that a consensus in biblical scholarship exists concerning the meaning of Old Testament Salvation by showing that a broader meaning always appears instead of deliverance from eternal condemnation nuance. In other words, whenever you see that nuance of, of uh, deliverance from eternal condemnation, talking about eternally saved, there's always a bigger nuance that goes along with it. Therefore, if anyone interprets salvation in the Old Testament as eternal condemnation, he will miss the meaning and application God intended to convey. Because he's saying that there is another meaning as well, which would be more of a physical type thing. 
Then we have, a, uh, this is uh, R.E.O. White, it's right here, uh, and he wrote Salvation in Evangelical Dictionary of Theology, and this is what he says. White states that, quote, the Lord is my salvation is the heart of Old Testament of Old Testament testimony always always that was the case he says later Judaism anticipated messianic deliverance which includes political national or religious elements are y'all getting that okay good y'all are right on right on the target now here's y'all y'all know who Joseph Dillo is reign of the servant kings uh, he says developing the same point Joseph C. Dillow states that, quote, the breath of salvation is so sweeping and intended aim so magnificent that in many contexts the words used, uh, used defy precision uh, or precise definition. Yet these difficulties have not thwarted numerous interpreters from assume, assuming, often without any contextual co uh, justification, that the words used invariably mean deliverance from hell or go to heaven when you die. That is a very true statement. And you've heard me say it many times. For most people, most Christians, when they see saved or salvation, it's always means eternal salvation. I call that an illegitimate uh, totality transfer. That means wherever they see it, they transfer that same meaning to it. It may come as a surprise to many that this usage of salvation, soteria, would have been the least likely meaning to come to mind of a reader of the Bible of the first century. We're reading it 2,000 years out, and we live in a completely different language, different culture. Can you imagine the changes that have been taking place since the first century? We read into it what we think it would mean now, and that's a mistake. He's saying to these readers, this idea that it was referring to deliverance from hell, when they're talking about sal salvation here, would be the last thing they would even think of. I gave you as an example also, for us, every time we say it, it says, it will save a soul, 99 out of 100 believers are going to say, every time that has, it's talking about saving the soul. Never does it mean that which I pointed out before. Okay, now this is, I think, maybe the next to the last or last uh, quote. This is by Bob Wilkin. He is the uh, president of uh, the Grace, you see, I don't know if he's the president of Grace Evangelical Society, but, but he puts out the magazine that is, um, what is the name of that magazine? We'll get it here. Anyway, he is a free grace. He's the mover and shaker of the free grace movement. It's called Grace Evangelical Society. He puts out a magazine, uh, and you can get it for free. Um, the name just, uh, I can't think of it right now. Uh, then, not surprisingly, Wilkin, Bob Wilkin, in his work, Salvation in the Old Testament, Part 1, on pages 2 and 3, says, quote, Biblical salvation rarely refers to salvation from hell. He says, even in the New Testament, this is especially evident in the Old Testament. During my doctoral work, I looked up every Old Testament occurrence of the various words which mean save and salvation. I found that over 90% of the references concern salvation from enemies and from other difficulties in this life. And he emphasized that, but he did it in, in uh, italics. I've got the whole thing in italics. He goes on to say, although Messiah's sacrifice is the means by which God furnishes eternal life, redemption for humanity, I'm going to leave out the things for right now for the sake of time, one must notice that in Isaiah's writing and in other prophets, it is also the grounds by which God will temporarily and eternally rescue by his mercy Israel from her enemies and permanently restore her to the promised land and national prominence. What he's saying is nearly every time that you see something that has to do with salvation or deliverance or whatever it is, it's, it's, all, it's nearly all the time, not all the time, but pretty much so, that it's talking about 
saving Israel from her enemies, uh, preserving Israel. That's the prominence of it. In Isaiah, the means and method, and he says that is Messiah's message, and he said he has a whole list of of uh, scriptures there, and you can look at these. These notes will be on the on the website by tomorrow morning, anyway. So Messiah's sacrifice of how God will restore Israel to the land of promise is an important element. That's mostly in the, uh, of course, the Old Testament. However, the emphasis of the meaning of salvation lies not on the means, but on the end result by rescuing Israel from her enemies, by restoring them to the promised land, and restoring peace on earth by which all humanity will benefit. You see, whenever you look through the prism of Israel, and you put that in the background of, of the Bible, that's what the Bible is about. You can't, Israel is God's chosen people. And he's got an immediate plan for Israel that is going to take them and bless them in a mighty way, give them more than he does anybody else. And then, like when they went into captivity with Babylon and so forth, but he brought them back. He's always going to bring them back. And eventually he is going to come again and he's going to give them peace but was never before or never will be. I'm talking about the millennium. It's all about that. And he's going to bring full circle. It's all about the focus is Hebrew, I mean the Jews, the Israelites, but we are included in that, in the, especially in the church age. The salvation experience in Isaiah finds its basis in justification through Messiah's atonement, but has a broader, a broader scope that encompasses all of God's national and universal promises to restore humanity to, faith, to a place and position of blessing. That's the goal. And Israel is the centerpiece of that. We all are included because we all are humanity. But that's why God is so hostile against anti-Semitism. Because they are attacking the apple of his eye and the whole plan is centered around them and the promises were made to them. And those promises will be fulfilled when Jesus Christ comes back. And then he says, uh, all, look at this again. The scope encompasses all of God's national and universal promises to restore humanity to a place and position of blessing which no one deserves. This is all grace, and that's the end. We made it, and it is dead on 7 o'clock. <laughs> that doesn't happen every time. <clears throat> so, um, the next... The next thing we are going to study in the book, would y'all like to know? Yeah. Okay. I'm not going to hide it from you. You can, uh, <laughs> you can go and read it if you want to. Here's the title right here. Must We Continue to Believe to Have Eternal Life? By Michael D. Macadon. And I heard him give on my Friday video conference, uh, Dr. Robbie Dean has, uh, we're going over this book. And he actually caught, he, he gets in contact with these authors, and the author gets on and explains his portion of the book, and we can either agree or disagree or have conversation about it. And I've already heard him on this one. And so, anyway, I think this is uh, where I'm just led to go next, because this is a major issue because most people, most so-called believers are Christians, professing Christians, let me put it that way, think you can lose eternal life. I mean, just take, for instance, the Catholic, that's about, what, over a billion people. And then you throw in the Church of Christ. There's so many uh, other ones, uh, the uh, Episcopalians, and, uh, and then you have the Mormons and the and the um, what are the uh, the, the, the what's the other group Jehovah's Witnesses yeah I mean you're talking about a huge number of people so we need to be re prepared to answer this question must we continue to believe to have eternal life that's where we're going next let's close 
Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for who and what you are and for revealing yourself to us. The more we know, the more we love you, the more that we just adore you and worship you. Everything depends upon who and what you are, and we're so happy. We might even say that we are hilarious happy that you change not. We can always depend upon you. You are always truthful. And to add the cherry on top, you answer our prayers. We thank you for this and pray that you will help us to think about this, put it in perspective in our own minds, that we can tell others about our great God. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.